The University of Detroit Mercy presents another brand new episode of Ask the Professor, the radio show on which you match wits with the University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. Today's program was recorded using Zoom video conferencing technology. The University Tower Chimes bring in another session of Ask the Professor, the show on which you match wits with University of Detroit Mercy professors in an unrehearsed session of questions and answers. I'm your host, Matt Mayo, and let me introduce to you our panel for today. All the panels have rearranged, so who knows who's going first? But this time, it's Dan Maggio. Oh, wow. Dan, 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 Dan. I mean, you could also consider it last and then building up the first, but I'll take first. Uh, I'm at the first shall be last, Dan, and the last shall be first. Yes, no mistake. <laughs> <laughs> What's been going on lately, Dano? I'm much just busy. Um, it's October, so breaking out the Halloween decorations, I think, this weekend. Oh, and, so um, well, that's a big I, surprise to Matt. I think that I yeah. missed you today, which means you saw Jane's Halloween decoration. I, I was in the office. I was chatting and catching up with Jane. And um, I think you were busy busy um, um, uh, with chairman duties, chatting with Liz, maybe. Or you were, who was in Liz's office now? Uh, that's Mara. Oh, yes. I think you were just chatting in there. Uh, I, I thought I heard you. And then I, so I visited with Jane. And then I... Um, uh, went over into to the bookstore. You know, I noticed that they carved out a place for a credit union in the side of the. Yeah. What was in there before? There was nothing there. Dan, are you oh, ready for this? No, I because I'm really curious. Like all my years there, what was in there? I don't think there was anything there. They knocked that wall down to build that. Yes. They were supposed to open the Monday after spring break, 2020. Hmm. Mm. Well, and then so much for that. <laughs> well, I was open for some secret chemistry lab or something like that. That would have been neater. So that would have been nice. But uh, yeah, they or, used to have, or they Matt, used to... we we could start that rumor. We could absolutely. They used to have one in the old days in I think that same space, a credit they union used... one branch. They used to have no. That was in the the oh, student union the building. Student yeah. union right. building next in to the lobby. The Across from the uh, bookstore. Right. Yeah. Now it's right. next to the Bursar's office or something. Now it's on the facing wall towards the uh, fountain ah. um, on the oh. outside part of the new student union. Hmm. But it's old, if that makes any sense. Someone who definitely is in Liz Roberts Kirchhoff's old office, but we call it Mara's office now. It's Mara Livesey. Hello. It's now my office. <laughs> And how are your kitties doing today? Oh, they're doing great. They, they really love it on Thursdays when I work from home the entire day. Do they actually give you some sort of outward like understanding of the fact they know that you're going to be there that day? I don't think they know that I'm here on Thursdays, but on Thursdays, you know, they normally would just like be doing their own thing. But on Thursdays, they make a special effort to be with me basically all day. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't be fooled, they're cats. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Don't there's, be there's, there's an ulterior motive, I'm sure. It means when they snuggle up with you, it's because they're secretly <sighs> plotting to kill you. Yes. So they're tenderizing you. Yes. Tenderizing. Exactly. That's all right. Exactly. <laughs> it's all right. I can accept that. And someone who knows a lot about her cat's plotting to kill her, it's Beth Oljar. Indeed. They have not yet succeeded, however. <laughs> Do they ever have their little paws sort of together, like evil plans like that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, when Mia's having an evil plan, she just sticks her claws in you. So, oh. you know. Well, that's, hmm. That gets the point across quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the furniture or whatever, you know, her scratching post. She's not particular. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Whatever's in front of her at that Everything moment. Everything right? is a scratching post, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Professor Stephen Manning is here with us, too. Good afternoon. What's going on, Stephen? 
I think I just heard our animal, our, our family pet bark, meaning he wants something. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think I heard that too. Off, though. I'm so happy for him. Yes, he got the cone ah. off. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I better, it. oh, she's going to attend to him. Okay. Somebody will. Yeah. So he's sort of back to normal after uh, he was in on Tuesday, I think, and he's kind of back to normal. We have to revise his whole diet, apparently. This hmm. condition was brought on by his, and this, this is particular with this breed, these Arctic animals. They don't absorb the zinc that they take in. Huh. So we have to um, make sure that the zinc he takes in stays in his body, is absorbed in his body. And what that typically means is raw food, raw meat, and raw chicken. So you're bringing in more whale blubber, right, Stephen? Yeah, that would be great. Whale blubber, anything, but it's got to be raw because the in, in the yeah. raw form, it absorbs into the body more, and we've got some... Uh, supplements and we have to seek out now a uh, a and most vets including ours a, a, admittedly has no idea what this condition is has never seen it before sure and so we're looking for a specialist in this breed of dog that can help us um how how much how much raw chicken do we actually give him right because the other part of this is uh zinc is toxic in in, oh, in, in too much i see large doses so, you know, you got to figure out exactly how much you got to give him. So, oh, my God. Well, I'm relieved to hear it's not the neighbors that you're feeding him. <laughs> yeah, not the neighbors. So that's been our life recently. Of course. Aye, aye, aye. Fresh back from taking care of your pooch is Heather Hill. Hey. <laughs> What's up? Well, what was the issue? We have to know. Oh, he the just whale, bl whale blubber. <laughs> He just, Whale blubber. To, he, he just had to go out. Oh, oh okay. Nature was and do his business. He went out with a harpoon. Yeah. Well, he, he, he also chased a squirrel for a minute. So, oh, fun. Great fun. Yes, it is fun. Is it you have an enclosed road? backyard. We do. Now we do. Yes. We now do. we do. Yes. Yes. So. Nice. He seems much happier since he started eating raw meat. <laughs> that's what uh steven was telling us yeah. about uh the legend of the zinc, the zinc we're, we're 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 of course resigned to eating grilled cheese sandwiches five nights a week right right exactly <laughs> eating a lot better than we are All government surplus cheese at that right so yeah. and, 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 and many pet owners. a variety of tinned foods <laughs> <laughs> three is now <laughs> Uh, Jim Tubbs is also here with us today. I was going to suggest there's always spam. <laughs> I'll have Tasty. you spam, dear. I like. I don't like spam. I can't tell you the last time that I've had it, but I know I've had it. The it's actually really Hawaiian. delicious. Yeah. It is. Okay. It yeah. is. Can't help but think of it when you're at your favorite uh, grocery concern and you see the sign hanging from the ceiling, canned meat. I'm like, I know what's in that section. That's right. <laughs> oh, my dad used to love that Underwood devil ham. He still oh. does. Oh, yeah. yeah that's, well, that's a little better than spam. He likes spam too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not everybody's bag of tricks, but that's okay. Not everybody's cup of potted meat. That's right. Potted meat byproduct. <laughs> ham shoulder. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that ham shoulder is uh, Dave Chow, our last panelist to be introduced for today. Pleasure to be here, as always. So. Excellent. Glad to have you, ham shoulder. I was going to say, and he's a ham shoulder. Apparently. It's a good one. It still works. It still rotates. So. <laughs> I'll tell you what, folks, this is a program you can send us questions regarding anything. If you stump the panel, you win a prize. If you don't stump the panel, you win a prize. You can send us questions in a number of ways. You can email us at atp at udmercy.edu. Find us on Facebook or Instagram or listen on your favorite smart speaker by asking it to play Ask the Professor at University of Detroit Mercy. It's been a while, but we have been favored with a nice, solid, chunky, delicious set of questions by our old friend and longtime question sender, Kimberly Richards of Van Nuys, California. And um, I think these are kind of all over the map. 
Kimberly always does a fantastic job of giving us background um, on the correct responses to these. So let's see what we can do with them. What was the first human-made object that could break the sound barrier? A whip? Yeah, a whip is what it says here, the bull whip in particular. The tip of the whip breaks the sound barrier and causes a sharp crack, which is literally a sonic boom. The sound barrier is a popular term for the sudden increase in aerodynamic drag and other effects experienced by aircraft and other objects when they approach supersonic speed. When aircraft first began to reach close to supersonic speed, these effects were seen as constituting a barrier, making supersonic speed very difficult or dun dun dun, possibly impossible. Very cool. Let's see. In dry air at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, the sound barrier is reached when an object moves 767 miles per hour. That is fast. I just or like, like when you call Mara's name out when she you know, when you volunteer her for something. That's all. Yeah, exactly. That, that spin really move was still right amazing. That was just unreal. Professors, which state in the Great Union that we have here passed the first law for a Labor Day? Ooh, well, it's one out of fifty chance. Oregon, Washington. It was. Oregon was number one, baby. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> that physician-assisted suicide, right? And legalizing all drugs. Wait, wait a second. Mara's <laughs> response is typical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what year? What year was it? Oh. Uh, <laughs> after 1859, because that's when Oregon was admitted to the Union. So. That that's is... a good start. You affect your world positively. Yes, that was uh, that was 1887, which is definitely after 1859. By 1894, we had reached about 50% participation by the states in the union. So just about seven years later, you were good to go. Uh, it says here, just real quick, right after Oregon, almost exactly after Oregon, same year, but Oregon was first, Colorado Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey. So it was the hip thing to do. Well, the weather's good in Oregon at Labor Day, typically. <clears throat> That's always but, a good you know, thing. If it wasn't raining, you want a holiday. Mm -hmm. I'm looking pretty uh, strongly here in a Jim Tubbs kind of direction because I bet that he's floated down the question this time, which is what's the longest river in Europe? I don't know. That's not what it says here. Daniel. Tagus? Elbe? Nope. Danube is pretty long. Let me think. It says this river is 2,300 miles long. That is a long river. That's a long cruise, Jim. Like going to the Volga Union? Ah, there we go. It's the Volga. The Volga in Russia. Super utterly technically Europe, but it is the longest river in Russia and the longest river in Europe. Yes. Stalingrad was on the Volga River. The Volga. The also, Volga. the largest reservoir uh, in the world is associated with the Volga. I can tell you where we don't have the world's largest reservoir anymore, and that's at the Hoover Dam since right. like half me, of the water is gone. Shriveling up. And I used to joke when I first started teaching that I was scared to death that somehow reps or senators from the Southwest were going to become super powerful and just build a pipeline from Lake Michigan all the way down. To and drain us silly. And now I feel like, oh my gosh, we're closer than ever before. The water wars are coming. Mm -hmm. What U.S. city has the most restaurants per capita at least 2019 pre-COVID. New York City. New York City. Royal Oak. Oh. Chicago. None of these that you have said. Oh. New Orleans. San yeah, I was going to say New Orleans, Los Angeles. There we go. I actually heard it. San Francisco. I think it was Hell. Oh, oh yeah. All right. Yeah. Huh. It wasn't going to um, be Clawson. Yep. Uh, adjusted for households, it said it's number one. Not only did San Francisco come out as number one with the most restaurants per capita, no other city was even in their league 
They have oh. 39.3 restaurants for every 10,000 households. Oh. Uh, San Francisco has nearly 50% more relative restaurants than the second place, which is Fairfield County, Connecticut. New York City doesn't even chart until number four. Mm. Man, we're talking food again? I know. Sorry. Oh. I'm trying to go as quickly as possible to the next question. Wow. What was the original name for the United States of America before Congress renamed it on the 9th of September, 1776? Uh, oh, not Britain. Yeah, Britain light. <laughs> oh. Something with confederation in it? Yeah. You know, it doesn't say that. It the West UK. Um. Had articles of confederation, so that yeah. would have made sense. Yeah, it, was, um... it says there was a resolution by Richard Henry Lee presented to Congress on June 7th and approved uh, July 2nd, 1776 and basically became official on September 9th. We are not going to be, I mean, this much I can give you, we won't be the blank of America anymore. We will be the United States of America. Kingdom? Colonies? Uh, don't think too hard. Yeah, Dave got it. It's the United Colonies of America oh. was the first name of our mm. country. And that makes say, sense. Yeah, like Vespucci land or something like that. I mean. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, we America. <coughs> so it makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. What city, what U.S. city was named for a British prime minister? Oh, Silence. Uh, Chamberlain, oh, Churchill. Oh. Pittsville? Uh, Atlee. Pittsburgh. Yeah. Pitt. A com combination Pittsburgh? of Beth and Jim. It's Pittsburgh, named after Pitt the Elder. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can't can't let it slip by. It's one of my favorite Simpsons bits of all time. The uh, the drunks are in the bar arguing over who the greatest British prime minister. <laughs> the one guy's yelling Lord Palmerston. The other guy's yelling Pitt the Elder. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just just classic sort of stuff. Yeah, so, classic bar uh, talk. P Pittsburgh was named in 1758 by General John Forbes in honor of William Pitt. Uh, formerly, by the way, uh, because we know there is a small, relatively small Catholic uh, university there, Duquesne. Um, Pittsburgh's original name was Fort Duquesne when it started. The yeah, earliest exactly. known reference to the new name of the settlement is in a letter from Forbes to Pitt the Elder, dated 17 November 1758, notifying Pitt had been given this, um, his name to the place. And it was also originally referred to as Pittsboro instead of Pittsburgh. We have a faculty member who got his doctorate at Duquesne. That's right. That's exactly right. What is the longest living mammal on earth? It's got to be a whale. It is a whale. So we're already at partial credit. Do you know what kind of whale? Blue whale? Mm -hmm. Blue. Blue. Mm -hmm. Beluga. No. Sperm whale? Killer. Nope. Great white. Finback? Whale. Uh, humpback? Minky whale? Dolphin? Orca. Orca. Oh boy. What this is other, a other kind of whales? Wonderful, wonderful little bit of historic knowledge, and I cannot wait to bestow it on okay, my on. wife and family when I get home. So they're called bowhead whales. Bowhead got whales. that name. Gotcha. Very specifically. Some bowhead whales in the modern era have been found with the tips of ivory spears in their flesh. And when they were carbon dated, the spear tips were over 200 years old Ooh. from ancient whalers. The oldest currently living bowhead whale is at least 211 years old. That's incredible. Probably still gets AARP cards sent to them all the time. So, <laughs> And when they pulled the tip of the spear out, there were words on it that said, 
we've been trying to reach you about your car's extended. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you all know we're, we're building a house. And that was the suggestion from my 13 year old son. Can we just get a Sharpie and write on the floor? We've been trying to reach you about your car's extended <laughs> warranty. So like a hundred years from now, when someone takes the house over, that's what they find. I'm like, you know, just... now is the time to start graffitiing up inside the walls, you know, Matt. So, I mean, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is a good one. The song, which many people know, they're the Sharpies. The song America the Beautiful was inspired by a trip to what very famous American landmark? Grand Canyon. Dollywood. Oh, Yellowstone? Wasn't Grand Canyon, wasn't Dollywood, wasn't Mount Yellowstone? Mount Rushmore? Mount Rushmore? No, Mara but I'll tell you what, it was a mountain, Heather. Oh. Mount Washington. Mount Rainier. Mount, Mount Rainier. Clemens. Baker, Mount McKinley. Mount St. Helen. I speak. Pikes Peak. Oh. Pikes Peak, oh, yes. It's the highest summit on the southern front range of the Rocky Mountains. Named in honor of Zebulon Pike, who was unable to reach the summit, by the way. And if I'm remembering correctly, I need some help. We are, we're not calling it Pikes Peak anymore. It has its original indigenous name as its official name at this point. Cool. Mm -hmm. In July 1893, Catherine Lee Bates saw Pike's Peak, and having admired the view from the top, wrote the words as a poem that she called Pike's Peak. Oh. Yep. First published July 4th, 1895 in a church periodical. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The plaque commemorating the words to the song are also on the summit. That's kind of cool. And how many other Zebulons do we know? Oh, my gosh. Zebulon is such a cool name. Like, I couldn't even wait to say it. So I, I mean, I have a Zebulon in my past. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, like wow. ancestor. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm talking current. Oh. You know, like somebody's. Come on, Matt. You know, do, hey, do, do, do you guys need a fourth? My firstborn. There you go. Zebulon. You heard it here. It's official. Awesome. Firstborn Zebulon. America is a beautiful country. I mean, for one thing, just think of all the different sort of, you know. Climate, Scott, yeah, climates and regions, yep. and mm -hmm. you know, we got mountains, we got oceans, we've got, pr pr I mean, literally, right? This desert, huge landmass, yeah, yeah. Ooh, this is another fun one. I feel like we've had this one before, but it's always good to do a quick update. Throughout most of history, the Academy Award Oscar statuette has been crafted out of a cheap alloy and plated with twenty-four karat gold. But for a three-year uh, timetable during World War II, Oscars were, Oscars were made of no metal at all, but rather... Wood or plaster? It was plaster. Yeah, they were painted plaster for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, for the record, following the war, thank you so much, Kimberly. This is so great. Oscar winners could swap their plaster statuettes <laughs> for the gold-plated <laughs> versions. Yes. Let's see, since 2016, Oscars, about 40 of them cast every year by a foundry in the Hudson Valley, have been made of gold-plated bronze. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences gave out the first statuette in 1929. Back then, it was referred to only as the Academy Award of Merit. I think we know the story that one of the helpers said, that kind of looks like my Uncle Oscar, and boy, oh boy, has a nickname ever caught on faster. What is the only planet that is not named after, be careful, a Roman god or goddess? Earth? Pluto? It's Earth. Earth, yeah. Earth, yeah. Mm -hmm. or For Earth. example, Saturn is named after the god of agriculture. Venus was the god of love. Neptune, of course, was the god of the sea, etc. Oh. But Earth is a different etymology. And Romulus and Vulcan and oh, all those others. Right, exactly. Although, as they call it in Lilo and Stitch, E R. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what oh, is, that's a great movie. What is Uranus? Is that a, the god of? He was the 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 grandfather of the universe. That's sort of the the co etymology there. Yeah, he was I, like, if Jupiter is Zeus, right? He was like Zeus's dad. Oh okay. wow! Mm -hmm. And was Pluto his dog? absolutely yes. okay just checking okay thanks bro, bro, bro. for two different oh, sets of greek gods that wasn't on the dog list 
<laughs> yeah, true. well, th- there's also two yeah. sets of dogs. What's the difference between Pluto and Goofy? I mean, mm-hmm. so. This is kind of interesting. Oh, my. Two numbers here. How many moons does Saturn have discovered as of 2020? Ooh. And how many of them have been named? They are not the same number. Say 12, 15. No, I think there's a lot more. It's like 47 or something like that. Maybe I'm thinking really. of Saturn. I thought Jupiter yeah. had the most. Yeah, that's what 19. I thought too. I, I think Jupiter's were in the 40. One of, my, one of my favorite bits of trivia when I was growing up, we knew because there are certain planetoids as part of the rings that are big enough to essentially qualify as moons. Oh, that Saturn oh, always yeah. has had the greatest number of moons. It's just oh. a matter of how many we plan to name. As of right now, there are 62 planetoids oh. that are moons and Sorry. only 53 have been named, including such fantastic names as <laughs> Albiorix, Farbaudi, Fenrir, that's a that's a that one's close to my heart right there. Narvi, Scatty, of course, Titan, and Ymir. Who's getting to so, name these? Who, who um, it, name? No, it, it's gonna it's gonna be like naming stadiums, well, that's all. I said 60. I'm claiming credit for this. Yeah, you you get yeah. it. You get it for sure. Very yeah, good I enough. didn't I didn't tell you that one of them is named. <laughs> Helene brought to you by SoFi Insurance, right? You uh, know, exactly. <laughs> I'm waiting for the Jim Tubbs or, you know, or something like that. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, Maybe we can I'll, name I'll, one for us. We could name an ATP. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. That sounds like a great idea. How long is the gestation period for a dog? Uh, anybody got a pregnant dog? Seven months. Four yes, months. Three months. Six weeks. <laughs> you all are so all over the map. And there's only been one of you that's even slightly close. Five Which months. one? Ten it's weeks. It. Ten weeks. I- I'm giving it to Heather. It's It says here it's nine weeks. Whoa. And what's interesting about the range of the different, you know, breeds of dogs is that the absolute error bars are only 56 to 66 days, no matter how large the dog is. It's very hmm. discreet, hmm. pretty interesting. I was listening to a, the very end of a radio lab today, and they're talking about an octopus that has a four year gestational period. Wow. Man, I don't octopus. even want to know what the morning sickness must be like for that poor thing. Yeesh. Good Lord. Hmm. Yeesh. What does a pregnant octopus crave? Pickles and ice cream? Sorry. Pickles and ice cream. <laughs> Let's see here. Comfort food. Stuff. Pasta. Oh, oh sorry. Let's, had to go again, down that get route. Get away from the food. Sorry. What major league pitcher uh, won the most Cy Youngs? Cal Ripken Jr. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Cy Young? Oh. No, Nolan Ryan. <laughs> Uh, Pedro Martinez. Uh, oh, uh, the reliever, New York Yankees. Um, what's his face? Mario uh, Rivera. Mario. Yeah. No, it doesn't say that. This person is one seven. I can run the rest of the list to sort of you know fill it out. Next in line is Randy Johnson uh, with five. Um, let's see. I remember when he um, played for the New York for a while. There's been several people who've won two. <laughs> And in 55 years, only 16 pitchers have won it basically more than once. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. No, it says here, um, I sigh for those baseball fans. It says Roger Clemens. Oh. Is the most oh. Young. Yeah. He said Roger Clemens. We were, uh, I didn't think it was him. I'm embarrassed. Me too. He, he won five? Um, he won seven, Stephen. Seven. Oh. Wow. Where right. basically the, the average is one, depending on the way you look at it, right? So... Your turn, Stephen. <laughs> it's um, it's the uh, award given to the best pitcher of the year for both the American League and or the uh, National League. And uh, since next week is um, uh, uh, what am I thinking here? Wild card week for Major League Baseball. I'm going to be glued to my television. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> Can't wait. Just a couple more questions here before we're going to have to say goodbye. Uh, what was the name of the ship that took Charles Jar- Darwin on his voyage to the Galapagos? HMS Beagle. Beagle. 
beagle. Absolutely. The platonic Absolutely. form of a dog. Mm -hmm. In my humble opinion. It may, if it question. hadn't been for his work, it may not have been uh, remembered at all. That is absolutely right. More doggy questions. <laughs> you want more dog questions? Oh, dear oh, Lord. We just had one. Beagle. We did. We did. Absolutely. Our show's going to the dogs. <laughs> Last but certainly not least for today, which country was it that produced the first adhesive postage stamp in 1840? Britain, France. Yes. It was. It was actually Britain. It was the Britain, UK. Think, yeah. Kind of a kind of a big deal, of course. Uh, not just for uh, postage, right? I, the original plan was to do things by way of taxation and and demarcation, things like that. So, what did um, they do before postage stamps? Was it? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Yeah. They were still in their empire days, you know. So, kind of mm -hmm. makes sense that they would have been first in that area. So it would just been like wax stamps or something like that, or just right. or they paid and they just stamped it at the post office. Um, according to historical record, Kimberly tells us, prior to 1839, the average number of letters sent was 76 million in the British Empire. Ooh. By the time you hit 1850, and you basically made the post accessible to everyone for pennies on the dollar, pennies on the pound. Over 350 million letters were circulating 10 years later. Hmm. Wow. Mm. Our postal service has actually always been hugely popular with the public. Yeah, it's true. Until it's we true. decided to appoint that idiot, the head of it, DeJoy, <laughs> and he and made them fund their pension 75 years out, which happened quite a while ago, which is why they've been struggling, why the post office has been struggling so much. But geez, it's in the freaking constitution. No, seriously. We're gonna have one. Yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those oddities of, um, of our government that we have this unbelievably important thing. And then the latest headline is, you know, one more day of the week is gonna get dropped. Yeah. Um, you know, it's going to take you even longer. Yeah. And we all have that story from last year where my parents in Berkeley mailed a Christmas card to my in-laws in Royal Oak, 0. 0.41 miles away. And it did not arrive until February 15th. Oh my. And uh, wow. stuff like that is all over the place right now, all yeah. over the place. Well, at least that was just a Christmas card. I mean, I can't even imagine the people's medicine and- Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yeah, like- just being, yeah. 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 I'm showing my privilege. I just think that it's incredible. It's like it mm -hmm. literally would have taken less overall energy and time- To walk it over. Yeah. Walk it yeah. across yes. Woodward. <laughs> I mean, like right now, I mean, you know, not mean to claim like first world issues, but you know, I've got a weed whacker. I'm missing, you know, we- order replacement parts it's not going to get here till middle of november oh yeah mm -hmm. and by the I'm way not be old, please yeah. don't order furniture it, it will scare the pants off of you things are backed up over two years right now it's furniture incredible incredible so when you guys move in do you guys need some more milk crates or something like that man I, mean, I was i'm telling you we're doing pallets and milk crates <laughs> oh, and uh and in upside down buckets you know and that's that's a great place to but sit but you right? know Rich people and corporations will not have to pay higher taxes. Absolutely so there's not. that. Absolutely That's the important not. point. You can't have nice things in America. Yes. Get your letter Oops. boxes now, you cat owners. <laughs> We're a, a little bit over, but I know that all the good stuff at the end will be kept in post. But the time has come for us to say goodbye, Dave. See ya. Jim. Goodbye. Heather. Bye-bye. Stephen. Bye. Have a good weekend. Beth. Goodbye. Mara. See ya. Dan. Goodbye. And now these words from University of Detroit Mercy. Ask the Professor is transcribed in, you know, all of our homes, but usually it's in the Briggs Building in the Department of Communication Studies in the College of Liberal Arts and Education at University of Detroit Mercy's McNichols campus. Ask the Professor is produced and technically directed by Michael Jason and Brian Masonville, and our executive producer is Professor Jason Roach. Until next week, I'm your host, Matt Mayo. <laughs>